his uh, Associate of Arts degree in Liberal Arts from Morris County uh, College. Mm -hmm. He received a Bachelor of Art degrees in Philosophy and History from St. John's University in Staten Island. Uh, he has a Master of Arts degree in Systematic Theology from Seton Hall. And uh, this past fall, um, he received his uh, Ph.D. in Systematic Theology from the University of St. Michael's College in Toronto, Canada, Yay. which is one of the leading uh, Catholic universities. Um, so, I mean, that's very, very impressive. Oh, thank you. Um, he's published articles in several theological journals, including Levain Studies, the Toronto Journal of Theology, and the Irish uh, Theological uh, Quarterly. Um, today's lecture was not planned in conjunction with the Founders' Day lecture on evangelization give by, given by uh, Bishop D. Uh, Kumha, but it does pick up uh, where the bishop left off. Um, I think it was yesterday in the paper um, I saw a, uh, a picture of uh, Pope Francis uh, giving a copy of uh, Evangelic Gaudium to uh, President Barack Obama uh, when they met uh, in Rome. Mm -hmm. So um, this is very timely and uh, the, the title of Dr. Dunn's talk is Interreligious Dialogue in Pope Francis the First Exportation Evangelic Gaudium of Dr. Dunn. Thank you. Thank you very much. For those who came in late, there is candy. Again, just so you know. Don't mind. I don't if you want to come down and get some even while I'm talking. Don't worry about me. I'm sure people were milling about while Jesus was talking. <laughs> well, you know, you think. Sermon on the Mount, you know, people are walking around, you know. But what did he say? <laughs> My students know some of this shtick already. But <laughs> Alrighty. But to the thing, because I know there's a time limit. Okay? My talk is about one part of the Pope's encyclical. To use a word from the Pope's native language, his or encyclical, excuse me, his apostolic exhortation is gigante. It's big. If you don't know Spanish, it's big. It's very long. I'm just dealing with one section of it in which he discusses the church's dialogue with those of other religions, other faiths. And even within that, I'm further you know, streamlining it to talk about one section of that. Because I, you know, I could talk about just one paragraph for 40-some minutes myself. Whoops. That. Okay. It's called an apostolic exhortation. I just want to give you some background on what that means if you don't know what it is. All right. Francis, as you might know, is the Bishop of Rome. Okay, so For some of you, this is going to be repeat. You'll know this already, but some people might not know it. Okay, So I'm just going to give you a brief overview. All right. The belief is that somewhere along the way, about 2,000 years ago, a Galilean Jew, a fisherman named Shimon, who was a follower of a man named Jesus of Nazareth, was called to be one of the closest followers of Jesus, which we call apostles. And that this man, Shimon, was even given this nickname, The Rock. He was a very important member of those closest followers. This apostle, Shimon Kephan, I put that on there, Simon Peter, we, might, we call him, eventually ended up in Rome. Don't ask how, he just did. Okay, I don't even think historians know exactly how, but the tradition is that he eventually ended up in the city of Rome where there was a pre-existing community of Christians and he kind of integrated himself in. He, you know, became part of the authority structure of that church. The first pope, some people might say, but I don't think you want to take that too literally. But he was there, okay? He was part of that church in Rome. And he died in Rome. He was killed for his faith. And so because he gave that ultimate witness of his blood for Christ, and the fact that he was there in Rome, there was seen this connection between Peter's authority, Simon Peter's authority, this apostle of Jesus, one of, the chief apostle of Jesus, and the bishops of Rome. So that's important. Why? Because of the first word, an apostolic exhortation. Why is it called apostolic? Because Francis believes 
he succeeds the apostles, namely the apostle Peter, Shimon Kepha. All right? So that's why it's called apostolic. Not that all bishops aren't successors in some way of the apostles. They are. Okay, but there's, since Simon was so important, there's a belief that the Pope has a special importance amongst the bishops, amongst the other bishops. Okay? An exhortation to exhort? What does exhort mean? Does anyone know? To exhort. Huh? To encourage. To encourage. Okay. What? To take from? Uh, I think you know, it's more like extraction to take from. No, it's not that. It's not that. Sorry. Whoops. I should do my slideshow. Do, 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 do. Don't worry about that. I always do too much. Because it's better to do too much than too little. What does exhort mean? To encourage. That's a good synonym. Appeal. Another word. To urge strongly. To exhort. And that's what an exhortation kind of is. It's an appeal. The first exhortation comes from that dude. I love that picture. I love the bling. It's just cool, you know? It's like, you know, when they're carrying the Pope around on a big seat. You can't really tell, but they're actually a bunch of dudes underneath there. It's called the Sedia Gestatoria. They used to carry the Pope around. It's almost like, you know, when, you know, well, it's not really done, I guess, now, but in the 90s when people used to jump into the crowds at rock concerts. <laughs> Catholic Church has been there a long time before people. All right? <laughs> you know, the Popes were jumping into the crowds before that. Sadie Adjustatory. And they got the big fan. I don't know what's going with the fan. We've got a Vegas thing going on. But that's okay. What happens in Rome stays in Rome. Pope Pius XII, venerable. He's on, he, may, he might be on his way to sainthood. We'll see about that. That's another, another issue. Um... But Pius XII is the first one that uh, issued what we call an apostolic exhortation. And I just show it to you so you can see that it's real, it's out there, okay? It's a relatively recent type of papal document, 1939, in this genre. And it's come to be associated with kind of like world meetings of bishops. After there's every few years, some rep not all the bishops, because that would be too many, and then you'd have a council, and then, you know, you'd have to do something. <laughs> they have a smaller council, a smaller meeting, a smaller meeting of representative bishops. Coffee bars are full, baby, you know? And they meet, and they talk on some, some topic. In the case of uh, 2012, a few years ago, it was evangelization, the new evangelization there you go, to exhort. For a, there's our Archbishop John Myers. I thought that was a great picture. You know you're being exhorted when you get the finger. <laughs> now listen, you. I want you to do this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there he is. Hey! Pope Francis. Okay. So, an exhortation is used, an apostolic exhortation is used to kind of sum up what was discussed at the Synod of Bishops. They take the consensus of ideas, things talked about, and the Pope issues usually an apostolic exhortation to sum up the synod. Okay, this, this group meeting. All right? Not a full council, but smaller than a council, so they have a special name for it, synod. All right? And they take the first two Latin words of the document, Evangelii Gaudium, and that's the name. Just trying to demystify. Demystify. You know the Pope likes you when you get the thumb, baby. If you get the thumb, I mean, it's not this anymore, you know, and it's not this. That was John Paul. This is Pope Francis, baby. Jesus loves you. Right back at you. <laughs> so this is it. The ordinary... What was he addressing? He was addressing this ordinary synod of bishops, this idea of the new evangelization. What does that mean? 
Well, it means a lot, as you can tell if you've seen the document. It's a thick document. As I said, it's gigante. It's massive. It's, it's big. And so the Pope had a lot to address, and he addresses it in his own style. There they are. There they are. I wonder who doesn't want to be there. You see that? <laughs> Ever look at these pictures and wonder who doesn't want to be there? Yeah. Well, you know, he's checking something out. I don't know. He seems to be paying attention. Ah, there he is, the guy in red, purple. There he is. <laughs> he doesn't want to be there. <laughs> so that's what his exhortation is about, and that's the context in which he's discussing interreligious dialogue, the new evangelization. Pope Francis has a way of... People like Pope Francis. I think that's generally agreed upon. I guess he hasn't really ticked anybody off yet. All right, so he hasn't, he hasn't you know, like run over a cat in the Pope Mobile, you know. So people like him for now, you know. Um, oh, that's don't worry about that. So people are talking about the Francis effect, it's the Francis imprint, imprint. Ooh, okay. They've got the Francis era. Yeah, I put it in yellow. You can't see it that well, or can you? Can you see it? Yeah. Francis era. The anniversary of his papacy was just a few days ago. Just a few days ago. Already we've got a Francis era. I mean, John Paul II was Pope for what? Almost three decades. And we don't talk about the John Paul II era. He must be in his grave like, what? I get no era? You know? <laughs> Wasn't it Pius IX who was the longest reigning Pope? Like, okay, we've got the Francis era already. Francis Factor, the Factor. He's a factor. You got to deal with him. The revolution. He's revolutionizing stuff. And then, of course, the paradox. Which I don't know what the Francis paradox is. Maybe we're going to find out that he's a woman. I don't. I don't know. I don't know what the paradox is. <laughs> no, too too late. Still too early in the day for that kind of joke. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't. But what's the paradox? What's his paradox? I don't know. The guy's already got a paradox. Like he's going to the Vatican physician. I got a, I got a paradox. <laughs> Number 250. He starts talking about religions, other religions. The church's dialogue with other religions. The church's talk. It's a fancy word for talk, conversation with people of other faiths. Give me a moment to look at that. Well, people love Pope Francis. One of the reasons, at least I've heard, is that they like kind of his down-to-earth style. Okay? Um, he's more down-to-earth. You know, they see it as a positive, you know, not that they, people might dislike Blessed John Paul II, but, you know, he was trained as a philosopher. Um, pope Benedict XVI was a lifelong academic and scholar. Okay? Um, doesn't mean that Pope Francis is a dumbo. <laughs> you know, he's a smart guy, you know, he know, and he's an educated man, but he likes to engage people, not, not you know, through academic style language or philosophical language, but through the, I guess you could say, the language of the streets, which sometimes backfires, like when he dropped the F-bomb, but, which really wasn't the F-bomb, it was actually, you know, um, I'm referring to a news event, but, yeah, he really didn't, he just mispronounced the word by accident, but anyways, anything the Pope does when you're the Pope is going to make news sometimes, especially when it's kind of funny. I think that this is helpful because it can make theology, religious studies, more understandable to people. It can help you understand what someone's talking about. So I think there's, there's a benefit to his, his speech, his down-to-earth language. And it can give the impression of him being more in touch with the ordinary and the everyday. You know, you might have heard, you know, when he was Archbishop of Buenos Aires, he rode the bus lived in an apartment. Okay, so this, this whole kind of aura of, that he has, he just has, of being more in touch with the people than being some guy, you know, lecturing in an ivory tower at some university or seminary or whatever. And that, I think that's a good thing because it can help quote-unquote normal people 
don't don't take that. And I don't mean that in a negative sense, but you know, the every say an everyday person to maybe take notice. Because, hey, the Pope's speaking my language. I kind of understand where he's going with this. You know, okay, it might not be something that you might see typically in a papal document or a theology textbook, but I, Joe Blow on the street, understand it. It makes sense to me. Which is, I think, is a good thing. There's a positive side to this. Um, this commonsensical, kind of realistic simplicity in his remarks also kind of a generality in this uh, you know in this section there's a kind of a generality and there's more to this don't worry you know there's more uh, I just put that on one power I didn't want to fit it all on one powerpoint slide because you'd be like you know way in the back like trying to see what it says but the dilemma could be that when you speak that way especially when you're someone like the Pope there's a danger in that style that, especially when it appears in a, an authoritative statement like this is, Evangelia Gaudium is. You know, there's a difference between, I say, the Pope is giving an off-the-cuff kind of remark to reporters on a plane, and this statement which is prepared. Because people might not always know what you mean. They might not always know what you mean. They might think you're being kind of blasé. And because, you know, we're rational creatures, our minds don't like a void, we can kind of pour into, actually, let's stay with this, pour into words what we want. For example, let me give one example from this opening statement of the, of the Pope about what is interreligious dialogue. He mentions fundamentalism. What is that? Tell me, please. Ah. Uh, what do you think? Go ahead. I guess being able to like have a conversation with, you know, someone of another faith and, you know, not to be so closed minded, but to come in with an open heart, open mind. You're not, you know, biased towards each other's beliefs or views. So you think that's what fundamentalism is? Well, I mean from the whole little opening quote that's what I that's what I get. Okay. So what you might be saying is that you think fundamentalism does he seem to be saying fundamentalism is the opposite? of what the Pope is trying to say? Dialogue is? Or you think he's saying that's what fundamentalism should be? That's his idea of it. Okay, good. That's fine. That's fine. What else? What do you think? What do you think? Taking things literally? like the Bible or the Quran or the Rig Veda, Book of Mormon. Okay, the fundamentals of your doctrines, your beliefs. Does the Pope seem to think that that's a good thing or a bad thing from this statement? It can be a hindrance to dialogue. You think so? Because I think your, fund, your idea of fundamentalism was good, but in the opposite way, as something that he's rejecting, because his, the context is kind of negative. He sees it as an obstacle, a, something that gets in the way, like the speed bumps on campus, which are okay. I don't, hey, I'm not, hey, I'm, I'm not criticizing the speed bumps. At least they're real speed bumps. They actually make me slow down. It's not like, you know, speed humps where you can, like, you know, go a little bit slower and then go, and a little bit slower. Here you have to kind of really, you know. I do, do find that some of the students do try to run me down every now and then. I don't think they know I'm an adjunct and it's really not worth their while. But such is life. I can move faster than I look. Let's put it that <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he's, he doesn't define it, but it seems to be, I would say it's negative. I think the definitions that were given about it, look at fundamentalism is being attached to the fundamentals of what you believe, taking things, we could also say taking things, you know, very literally, or maybe, uh, maybe a fundamentalist would say seriously. You know, like I might say, I take the Bible seriously. Because I think, you know, I've met people who, 
you might say read the Bible literally, but they know poetry when they see poetry. I mean, they know what a story is. Okay, they don't take everything literally, but they might say, I take it seriously. The Bible says that God created the world in six days or six ages or whatever, and not by a big bang. I take that seriously. Okay? Might not still not agree with them, but it, you know, at least the person is you know, saying, I take it seriously. See, that's the problem. He seems to understand what fundamentalism is. I don't. Theologians have been... It's become a word, kind of a buzzword that's been in theology. I don't know when it entered. I know it's recent, maybe the last 20 years, two decades, maybe even less than that. And I've always had kind of a question mark, and now it appears in a papal statement. And this is the only place that he uses it. And he seems to know, and he seems to assume that you will know or I will know, but I don't. Who's fundamentalist? These guys? They fundamentalist? Any Latin mass fans? Holla. Huh? No? No? Got a maniple hidden away somewhere? A maniple? Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> That's a maniple. That's a maniple. A little cloth that priests and deacons used to wear on their arms. Why? Don't know. People guess. Say, priest use it to wipe his nose or keep flies away. I don't. You know, we don't know. But it's an ancient vestment. But it's not. You know, it's not necessary. It was not made optional, and then kind of fell into disuse. Go ahead, sir. Ooh, good. I'm thinking, uh, see, this is the thing. I'm coming at it from a theological perspective. Are you thinking more scientifically, fundamental, like foundationalism, or philosophically? All, all the different theories of theology. Yeah. Set the problem. I, and I don't think the Pope means it in that way. Okay, I think what he means is a kind of rigidity, um, a rigid religiosity, which wants to use religion more as a control than as something to which someone witnesses and shares with others. That's what I think. Let me tell you how I got there. <laughs> That's what I think. That's my theory. Because this is, as I, once again, this is the only place the Pope uses the word. It does appear, I've seen it in a number of theological articles, again, undefined. Usually it's applied to groups like this. You know, like people who love the old Latin Mass. Who doesn't love the old Latin Mass? <laughs> no one wants to come out against the old Latin Mass? Okay, I'll come out against the old Latin... No, no, no. <laughs> I can do that because I'm Eastern Catholic. You know, we've got, you know... <laughs> I'm Ukrainian Catholic, so... I can say what I want about the Westerners. No, I can't. I'm, sorry, I'm just messing. Um, this is the group fully in union with the church, in fact, founded by Pope John Paul II. May he rest in peace. Um, their mission is to staff parishes. They, they like the old liturgy. They are today. They, this is not, these are not pictures from 50 or 100 years ago. They have bishops ordaining their men. Ah, the nuns on the bus. Nuns on the bus go round and round. Nuns on the bus. I don't know about you, but I, nuns or no nuns, I don't want to be on a bus traveling across the country. I've gone on Greyhound too many times driving up to Canada. You know, it was not a pleasant experience unless the nuns have like, you know, a real posh bathroom and a kitchenette and some really nice beds. I ain't going with the nuns on the bus. <laughs> Mr. Dunn will fly and stay in a hotel. <laughs> But God bless them. They're out there. These are sisters and nuns from various religious orders, various religious groups, you know, talking about social justice, protesting the School of the Americas in Georgia, where our government teaches torture and various other things to foreign, 
foreign militaries. I don't think they call it the School of the Americas anymore. I forgot what they renamed it to. But anyways, but it's still ba there basically doing its same business. Um, here you see a sign, no to the Ryan budget. I think that's Paul Ryan. He's Republican, yes? Yes. Okay. So they're protesting whether, you know, I guess in his budget he doesn't give enough money to the poor or gives too much money to the poor. I guess if he's a Republican, he's not giving too much money to the poor. <laughs> no, no political joke? Okay. I don't want this to show up on Fox News. I'm just kidding. I, was, I, just, I kid, I kid, okay? <laughs> I'll have Charles Krauthammer all over me. It's the liberal bias on college campuses. No, it's not. I'm just messing around with you. Okay, but they had some issues. All right, they're talking about politics, and they're bringing their faith, as they see it, to these issues, social justice. So who's the fundamentalist there? Are they fundamentalists? Because I've heard people who would say the other group, with their Latin and their incense and their nice little vestments and stuff like that, and they're fundamentalists. I've never heard anyone call them fundamentalists. So what is it? Well, I had to go to a book that the Pope wrote with a rabbi. No, not Jesus. Another rabbi. <laughs> this guy. This Argentine rabbi, Rabbi Skorka. The book on heaven and earth, Sobre, sobre pardon my, my Spanish pronunciation, Sobre el cielo y la tierra, which from what I understand, will be coming out in English, I think, next month. Of course, before that, no American publishing house would touch it, would have touched it. You know, but now that the guy's Pope, it's like, ooh, this is gold. You know, we got to publish this. He co-authored this book, and they deal with a variety of questions, abortion, same-sex marriage. One of them that comes up is fundamentalism. And that's where I found an idea of what he's getting at here. Okay, this rigid, as I said, a rigid religiosity that wants to kind of impose religion rather than share it. And even then I had to kind of work backwards. You know how you kind of, sometimes you, what do they call it, reverse engineering? Because again, he doesn't say what fundamentalism is, he says what it's not. So if you go through and take out it is not this, not this, then you come to a definition. See, that's how scholars work. That's what we do with our time. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun, especially when you get published. <laughs> and in that book, that's where the question comes up. Um, I have a little oops, quote from the Pope. Did I put it on the PowerPoint? I don't think I did. I hope I not actually no, I didn't, because it's only I'm only quoting part of it, not the whole thing. Uh, oh, I just got to find it. There we are. What does he identify as fundamentalism? A person who propose, or someone who proposes the truth, or non-fundamentalist, I should say. Someone who is not a fundamentalist proposes the truth revealed and accompanies a person despite failures. Okay. Well, that's pretty... Well, all right. That's kind of general. All right. Can we get more specific, Holy Father? Well, it wasn't Holy Father at the time. He was the Cardinal Archbishop of Buenos Aires. A non-fundamentalist person does not make decisions for the follower, the disciple. He respects the religious personality of the human person. He walks with that person in his or her spiritual life. And this is where he gets into rigid religiosity. This is where he does get into kind of, a, a, well, not kind of, he does get into a positive definition. Fundamentalism is a religiosity, a rigid religiosity that disguises itself with doctrines, with teachings, religious teachings, that pretend to give justifications, reasons, but really do, are meant to deprive people of their freedom. Now what does that mean? Well, I think what he means is people who like to use religion to beat you over the head to do what they want you to do. I think. I think that's what he's getting at. And I think that's what's behind his quotation in the document. Dialogue is not to um, meet the person, the religious other, if you will, quote-unquote other, the person of another religion to beat them over the he head with the Bible or the Gospel. But to share your experience as a Christian of Jesus, as a Catholic of Jesus and his church, with other people in conversation. Right? 
Think of the example of Jesus. Jesus allowed people to walk away from him. You know? Jesus allowed himself to be rejected by people. There were people who followed Jesus who eventually said, hey, I can't accept some of the things you're teaching. And they walked with him no more, says the Gospel of John. But Jesus didn't go back after them and say, well, we'll tweak it, we'll tweak it, we'll repackage it. Okay? I don't mean eat my flesh and drink my blood. You know, I just mean believe in me. Well, you know, we'll, we'll work with it. No, he turns to his, some of his other followers and says, will you also leave? You go, he leaves the door open for them. He was, these were the apostles. He was willing to let them leave too. Mmm! Jesus ain't changing for nobody. Jesus is Jesus, baby. When Jesus lays it down, it's down. He doesn't take it back up. So he, but he allowed. Does that mean the people who walked away were going to burn in hell? You know, did Jesus say, "Hey, I'm the Son of God. I'll see you in hell"? Well, not he can't be in hell, but because he's, you know, I mean, I know God is everywhere, but God's not suffering in hell. You know what I'm saying? You know, but you're going to be in hell, sinners. No, no, and it doesn't. Why, and you don't have to infer from that action that they. They were damned or somehow harmed. He respected their personhood. They could not accept what he was teaching for whatever reason. And I think the Pope, when he talks about fundamentalism, is when the church does not want to be fundamentalist in the sense that you, can't, you have to be like Jesus. You can't get all un, you know, un, uh, unke- not unkempt. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, you can't lose it or become all out of control because someone says, after all the reasons you give why you believe in Jesus, oh, I don't believe that. Well, you should believe it. You're going to burn in hell. <laughs> Calma. Cal- <laughs> Calm down, baby. You know, <laughs> Follow the example of Jesus. All right? I think that's where he's coming from with, when he talks about being able to walk with people they might not be at a place that you are. And also remember that you ain't God. All right? So you might not be at the place that God wants you to be. God might be trying to speak to you through the other person. I love that hat, sir. That's a beautiful hat. Thank you. God bless you. There's candy if you want it. But kudos on the hat, sir. Kudos on the hat. I just wish that he had spelled it out more. You know, I... Because I, it's one of those weasel words which could, you know, you pass over it and you're like, you know, it, all it does, in my, in my view, it just reaffirms the bias of the reader. Usually negative. Oh, yeah, fundamentalism. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, those Baptists, Southern Baptists, they want to convert the world. Fundamentalists, you know. Oh, those Catholics that go to those Latin masses or want to kneel to receive Holy Communion. Fundamentalists, you know. You know, it's, I just wish he would, uh, you know, have, have defined it better. Defined it better in that sense. But then I would have had nothing to talk about and you wouldn't be here. So, thank you, Pope Francis. God bless you. Interreligious dialogue is necessary for peace. It consists, first of all, notice that, first of all, talking about human existence. Human existence and sharing with people their joys and sorrows. and Through that way, the church and those involved can learn to accept the differences of others. Their different ways of living and speaking. What, what's the matter? What's the matter? No, I just was writing that. Oh, well, you're take, taking notes. Who taught you to take notes? Um, Mr. Hopkins told us. Did, did I? Is he here? Oh, I've got to talk to this dude. <laughs> Who the hell taught you to take notes at this are. college? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Have I ever taught you to learn? Have I told you to learn? Have I ever told anyone? No. This is... Yeah, that's, see, that's <laughs> fundamentalism. All right, baby. All right. Fundamentalist high five. Okay. All right. <laughs> No, no learning, people. No learning. 
<laughs> I'm moving on. I'm moving on. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, it's you know the slide. It is what it is. I apologize. I'll, I just, but I want to jump through these things because I just want to highlight these words. Okay. All right. Justice and peace. In any church document, eventually you're going to run into the words justice and peace, brother and sister. Here's my brother, sister, brother justice, and my sister peace. Hey. Okay. <coughs> Social peace and justice. Okay. An ethical commitment. Ethics and the social situation, meaning how societies are organized. Are they organized justly and ethically, or are they not? Or are they not? Mutual listening, we want to listen to each other, which can purify and enrich us, because my biases, my bigotries, my prejudices can be taken away. Makes me think of, just recently in the news, with Sikhs. Sikhs. You ever hear of a Sikh? Started in India. Okay? They're a religion. Yeah? They worship the one God, but they also have some... It's kind of a... I mean, this is not fair to them, but the way I, from my mind, understand it is kind of a mixture of ideas from Hinduism and Islam. They take... With the, the meeting of Islam with Hinduism... Um, they take the idea of one God, but they also have ideas like reincarnation and stuff like that, which is prevalent, is denied by Islam, but would be very common in, in Hinduism. But, you know, to be a religious Sikh man, there are certain demands. You have to wear a beard. Ah. I love a God with a beard, baby. That's why I worship Jesus. See, the Hindu gods, they just have the mustaches. I need a beard. Beard. Okay. I could become a Hindu because of the food. I love Indian food. I'm not big on the kosher. But, whatever, Jesus has a beard. So, and he's got the heavy metal hair. So that's like the twofer. You know, you just can't. I can't. You know, the, the hair and the beard? Come on. It's got to be Jesus. No? Ooh, okay, sorry. Uh, where was I? Oh, yes, Sikhs. They have to dress a certain way. You have to have a beard. You have to wear a turban. Um, somewhere along on their person they have a knife. Not for violence, it's a symbol. Okay, don't, you know, go nutso. Um, and they got other stuff. And people think they're Muslims. And they get rousted by people. Well, some of them, I've, the news stories, maybe you've heard these, have gotten killed because people thought they were Muslims. Because they don't talk to them. They don't, talk, they don't ask them, what are you? If you don't mind me asking, what religion, or, you know, why do you wear the turban? You know, in a respectful way. And so what if they were Muslims? Let's say they were Muslims. Still can't talk to them? It's harder to kill somebody when you know them, because you might actually like them. <laughs> you know, like, I, you know, these Muslims, you know, we clash of civilizations. And then you find some Muslim who listens to, like, I don't know, death metal or something like that. <laughs> you know, oh, oh, Allahu Akbar, baby! You know, it changes the dynamic. Well, doesn't it change the dynamic? I mean, how can you hate your brother Muslim who is headbanging right, in, right there with you? You know, so it's harder to kill somebody when you see them and you talk to them. So dialogue does that. Dialogue does that. Mutual listening, and by that mutual listening, your bigotries can be purified, your prejudices can be purified. You learn about them. things, And they learn about you. They learn about you. They might learn, okay, yeah, Mr. Dunn wants to save my soul and make me a Catholic. Okay, I do. <laughs> you didn't hear that, but I just, you know, that's, that's my subterranean... That was my mission from the Vatican. <laughs> Especially the Methodists. We've got to do something about those Methodists. <laughs> okay? But they might also understand that, you know, I'm not going to put a sword to their throats and take them down to the river as sometimes was done in the past and say, well, you know, Jesus or the sword... <laughs> Yeah, you know, but, but at least if they die baptized, they're going to heaven, yes? Yeah. Love for truth. Well, that's the last thing. This is a statement I just found from the UN, a statement on religious tolerance. 
I think, uh, do I have a date here? I put the date down. Oh, I hope it... 2005. So it's recent. 2005. Notice similarities. I tried to point them out. Okay? This is where, you know, uh, this is, uh, you know, I try to be positive about what the Holy Father writes, but, you know, you, you're an academic, so you always got to get your little digs in, like, I could have done it better, Pope, you know? <laughs> you know? I know. I'll, I'll spend a few years in purgatory for contradicting the Pope, Lord. I know. That's okay. Just pile them on to the others. <laughs> it, it, it. By the way, there's holy water in Mother Joseph Hall, you know, in the fonts, the chapel. There's now holy water in the fonts. So if you want to... It's Lent time. I just thought people might be interested. Take a little holy water and put blood. No holy water? Okay. You're not going to melt. It's not like the Wicked Witch of the East or something. It's like a, oh, holy water, I'm burning. Might even be good for your soul. It might. No, okay. Anyways, I don't judge. I just point it out. I wish that the Pope had said a little bit more because his description of interreligious dialogue, he never mentions even God. Forget about Jesus. It's human existence. Okay, fine, you know. But philosophers can sit around and talk about that. No offense. I am a philosopher. No, but I, I'm a philosopher. You know, I have a degree, but well, I'm not a master's, but, you know, I love philosophy, so that's not a problem. But, you know, people, people, thinking people, even non-degree, oh my gosh, you know, people who don't have degrees can actually sit around and talk about these issues. You don't have, what's religious about the Pope's description? Peace and justice, the, the UN is not for peace and justice, tolerance, respect, cooperation. The Pope doesn't mention progress, but everything else is kind of there. Peace, human welfare, understanding, diversity, difference. They don't mention truth, but that's not a big surprise. It's the UN. I mean, you've, I, don't, I don't mean that in a negative way. It's just that you have a group of, you know, a lot of people at the UN. You know, not all of them would agree that there is one truth or any truth. They might say truth is relative. Some people might say it's not. So, you know, you're going to shy away. But usually people can agree on being peaceful and being peace and tolerant and stuff like that. I mean, there's not many people at the UN, I think, that said, no, we want to kill the Jews. Yes. Or we want to kill Christians. You know? Or Christians saying, yes, we want to kill Muslims. I don't think that would go over very well at the UN. <laughs> I think the mic might be turned off. Tolerance. Tolerance. You know? So whatever people might be doing on the streets, or might think really in their hearts, you know, tolerance, respect. Okay. How is this different? How is the Pope's discussion of interreligious dialogue different from this? How is it distinguishable? Because the Pope says that it has to be. You know, in his first homily as the Bishop of Rome, you know, he said this, and he said this to his brother bishops if we have to confess Jesus Christ, if not, we become a pitiful NGO. Not the church. Not the church Christ founded. What's an NGO? What's an NGO? Any poli-sci people here? International studies? Diplomacy people? You want to... No? 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 Dude, you look very laid back. <laughs> I don't even think... Are you, are you awake? Are you <laughs> What's an NGO? Uh, no, it's not a muscle car from the 60s. A non-governmental organization. A non-governmental organization. That's how they classify groups that have politi maybe political motives, maybe social motives, but they're not political entities. Okay? Um, like, I guess Red Cross would be an NGO. Okay? They go just go anywhere, or the Red Crescent as well in Muslim countries, to help people who are... In, in trouble and you know from natural disasters, but you know the politics is, you know is not really it's left out. You know that's not their purpose. Um, there are Catholic organizations that are like NGOs. That the, the UN has a ton of them. 
I don't know why he chose to use this analogy of non-governmental organizations, because first of all, I think if I worked for one, I wouldn't think it's pitiful. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, you know, Pope Francis bringing the slap down to you. <laughs> We're not a pitiful NGO, you pitiful NGO, with your pitiful NGO employees. Thank you, Holy Father. <laughs> But when I read his section on interreligious dialogue, I don't see how that's not a statement that any NGO could make dealing in this area. You know, a, a group, any group can deal with tolerance and trying to build bridges between religions. You don't not even have to be necessarily religious about it. You know, but you want to maybe understand and build bridges. What's this mean for the church? Ooh, what did I do with this? Oh, there we go. <laughs> Hiding on me, my little friend. We have to read kind of earlier in the document, all the way up to number 15. Number 15. Because if you just read 250 out of context, which I don't want to do, although it's kind of a necessary little dodge I do. I take it out of context and then show you what its context should be. You know what I'm saying? So it shows like I'm clever. You know? <laughs> Mr. Oh, I guess you figured out I'm not that clever. Okay. All right, moving along. The Pope is clear that Christ should be preached, and I would assume this includes interreligious dialogue. Even in dialogue and conversation, um, that would be just understood. I think that's the understanding of, of the Holy Father, of, of the Pope. And that's why I think, you know, it needs to be, you need to read his comments in, in light of other comments in the apostolic exhortation and not try to read it out of context. The Pope says that dialogue should be open to truth and love, it should be done in love. I don't think one should have to infer that the Pope means all truth is relative or that there's nothing singular or unique about the truth that the Church preaches in Jesus Christ. But he says... Hold on a second. Is this, did I have it on this PowerPoint or was it the other one where he says proselytize? Mm. Yeah, it's, I think it's on the next one. There we are. And this ties into what I think his idea of fundamentalism is. Rather than appearing to impose one's faith, one's belief, and it, remember, it is your belief. You may think it's absolutely true across the board. Jesus is the Savior of the world. There's one God. The church is the body of Christ. You might, you know, the Bible is God's revelation. You might believe that all across the board. That's totally true to you. Okay? But remember, the faces across the, across the table at you, that might not be so self-evident to them. So instead of imposing one's faith as an obligation, it should be a sharing of joy. It's the gospel. What does gospel mean, Mr. Strumpf? Good news. Good news. I've got good news to tell you. Unless you get baptized, you're all going to die. I'm going to kill you if you don't become a Christian. Isn't that good news? No? It's not good news? Not good news? <laughs> I'm not sure I would think it was good news. Hey! I got something great to tell you. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> what, the Catholic Church as Dexter. You know, it's like... Yes, yes, yes. It should be a sharing of one's joy. It should be good news. And not proselytizing. Eh, this is another one of those weasel words. What does proselytize mean? You could translate it, not try to convert people. Okay, but he doesn't mean like you shouldn't share the gospel or invite people to change their heart and minds to Christ. I don't think he means that because he says... The gospel is meant for those who don't believe, not just for those who believe. It's meant for me as a Christian to remind me of how I should be acting, and it's meant as good news to the one person who's not Christian to invite them 
into a relationship with Jesus and his church. So I don't think he means proselytize as a form of mission. Well, he think, I think he means it that it's when you have a form of mission or conversion that does not present the message of God or message of Jesus as good news that makes someone happy and should make the convert happy, but as a burden. Okay, now you're a Christian, we got you, you know? We got you. Or as a threat, believe this and die. Or die, I should say. I didn't say and die. That's the wrong message. So, gee, could you imagine if the missionary said that? Get baptized and you'll die. Oh! <laughs> no. It uh, shouldn't be a threat. Like, oh, some bad consequence is going to happen to you because you don't become a Christian. Or it's a product, like converts or notches in the belt. Well, I got three people today. Hopefully I'll get a few big fish tomorrow. You know? Like you just... Boom, 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 boom. Like a business. Like a business. Or a form of control, you know? If I bring you to the faith, now you owe me something. You have to believe what I do, think the way I do, dress the way I do, take my name, take my culture, in addition to Jesus. Go to India. A lot of Indian Christians have Portuguese last names. They're totally Indian, not Portuguese drop of blood in their bodies. No Portuguese in their ancestry. And yet you'll come across people who, whose families have been in India for how a, can, mists of history, you know. But they became Christian, they were converted by the Portuguese, and they took their name. So you got a Ribeiro, a Gonzalez. Go to the Philippines, you find the same thing. Hispanic names. De Leon. Stuff like that. Luis. But they're Asian. They're not Hispanic. There's nothing Hispanic about them. Their culture is Hispanic. Mixture of Hispanic and Asian. Why was that done? I'm not saying, you know, some people could justify it and say, well, whatever. And maybe these people did it as, as gratitude, but also there were some benefits of being the friends of the Portuguese. You know, the Portuguese had better technology than what they were finding in their native land. And they had power. They had power. Guns and whatnot, cannons and all sorts of stuff. Stuff like that. So you become one of them, you know. Can't, you know, so there's this idea of you know you can't really stay what you are and still accept Jesus. There's like there's something wrong with your native Indian culture. It could be a form of control. You'll you know because we brought Christ to you now you will rule yourselves the way we do. You will fight in our wars. You know, you will support our economy almost like you know a give back for Jesus that we brought to you, the benefit of Jesus. You owe us. So I don't think that he's saying that the gospel can't be shared. I think there is an evangelistic dialogue. I don't think he's not saying there's not an evangelistic dialogue. But it's simply a philosophical dialogue about peace and justice, social issues, human existence. Are we all getting along? Are we all tolerating each other? Good, yes. You know, why do you do that? Oh, okay. No, I didn't understand that. Now, why do I do this? Oh, that's... You know, I think there's that part of it to dialogue, but it, I think also he sees it from the context of the gospel that human beings from the Christian revelation, which is really the Jewish revelation I'm referring to, in the book of Genesis, men and women are created in the image of God. Before church, before... Even before... Well, don't say that. But before, so that's where you're finding everybody. People are, are formed and made in the image of God, even before any consideration of they've been baptized or not. And they're also, in a sense, Christ-directed. They're directed towards Jesus. If you believe, as Catholics do, that Jesus is the second person of the Blessed Trinity, I got you, I'll wrap it up. Uh, second person of the Blessed Trinity, he's the Son of God, and that God, according to the Scriptures in the New Testament, for example, the Gospel of John, or Paul's letter to the Colossians, if Paul wrote the letter to the Colossians. But Paul's letter to the Colossians, Jesus was the instrument through which God created everything. So, image of God, 
and also some kind of mysterious spiritual relationship with Jesus, through whom God created their soul and created the whole world. Before baptism, before you arrived at their shores with, hallelujah, the good news of Jesus Christ, or sat down at their table to tell them about Jesus. So I think that's what he's calling for in interreligious dialogue. Not that you would pull back from talking about Jesus, but that uh, you would remember that it's not about you, it's about Jesus. <laughs> it's always about Jesus. And I think I'll end with him. I think that's a good place to end. Jesus. Thank you for listening. There will be a question, I'm sure. I, I would just like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Dunn you know, for this very interesting uh, lecture. And uh, he will remain uh, for any questions. Um, I would just like to ask w one question. Go ahead. Uh, did the Pope write this? I mean, I know in the past a lot of Popes don't write uh, their own even uh, encyclicals. You mm. know, they have uh, theologians. Does this Pope um, write his own stuff, or does he use a, a team of theologians do you know is there any on this document that, that's a, I'm glad you brought that. actually it's interesting you brought it up because I kind of cut that out but now I can say um, that's, a, that's a question for me because a lot of the document I think yes because you can kind of see his style the way he talks I mean oh, granted it's only been a year you know you don't know you know whatever um, but you get a sense of how he talks and the kind of images he likes to use and, and stuff like that and some of that appears throughout the document um, as I said, this very down-to-earth style, I think you can attribute more to him than to a ghost writer. But it is right. I mean, there are, the popes do have ghost writers. I mean, you know, the pope's hanging around, the deacons are, you know, writing the encyclical form. <laughs> and he's just, you know. But, yeah, just one second. This section on interreligious dialogue, I really had a question if he wrote this, because it almost seemed like it was just taken out from any statement that the Vatican could have, has issued on this issue in the last 50-some years and just stuck in there, you know? Um, I think most of this was written by him. His first encyclical was not. He might have touched it up a little bit, but the first encyclical, Lumen Fide, Fidei, was it's generally accepted. It was written by Pope Benedict um, before he resigned and it was still kind of lying around. Instead, Now, the Pope could have just tabled it. Francis could have said, well, this isn't me. We don't need to issue this. You don't have to do that. Um, but he decided to do it with making some adjustments. But especially the critiques of the economy, which got a lot of attention. Um, and I think Francis has a way of really bringing, and I really like, of bringing things back to the Scriptures, you know, and, and using biblical images that I think are him. I think are him. But if I found out that I'm totally wrong, oh, all right, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Appreciate it. So, can you ask my question, sir? Where do we sign in so we get credit for the class? You got to, yeah, me. I just showed up to talk. So I just, uh... Which class are you in? Yeah. Oh, Sister Cro Barbara Sister Krug? Sister Krug told me, um, uh, that... Not to worry about that, but I, I'm perfectly willing to have you uh, sign a sheet that I'll give to her if, okay. if that would be helpful. Why don't I put that up here, and anyone who, who needs to, to sign in, do that, and then I will certainly make sure she gets that to recover. Okay? Thank you for coming today. Thank you. No. No. I can't. You showed up. No, you weren't. You heckled me. You took like 50 lifesavers. Yes, sir. You that was still good. No, I, I, I had some of them. I had the yellow one and I had the purple one. Oh, okay. And you had the yellow one. I don't want to be hyped up for you. Well, you're not going to get extra credit. You'll do the assignment, and for that, you'll get your credit. You don't love it. Um. Because I don't know who was here. Me. You were here. O'Brien was here. Cooper was here. And Pateas. And Pateas. Okay, remind me at the next class. I'll take your names down and I'll give you a, a couple of points for showing up. Uh, I know. I'm wonderful, aren't I? Um, well, I'm giving out points. Yeah, I'm beautiful. When you fail a test, I'm the Antichrist. Yeah. Oh.
I don't want to torture him. Just in case. Okay, I'm over. Over and out.